Thank you, thank you. Greetings, everyone. Let's talk about flywheel energy storage systems. They're pretty cool, and we're, we may start to see a whole lot more of them. You clicked on it, so let's get into it. Let's talk about what flywheel energy storage systems are, and then we'll talk about what the risks are and how to manage those risks. So a real quick basic diagram, we're talking about a flywheel, just a big heavy wheel that spins. Use a motor generator to make it spin and get the energy back out of it. We'll get into some more details as we go along. One of the advantages is that they have very long life cycles. You can charge them and discharge them over and over and over for up to 20 years compared to chemical batteries, you know, this is a much longer life cycle. The other thing is that it can be the first line of defense because they're so good at handling these run-ups and run-downs of the energy needs. We actually see them being used to protect battery systems. So the batteries are there for more for backup, but the flywheels are there for the surges and the uh, slowdowns. So What's in a flywheel energy storage system? There's the rotor, and we'll talk about that a little bit in more detail, but it can be made of composites or it can be made of metal. And we'll look at some of the advantages and disadvantages of each of those materials. The bearings are going to be very interesting. There's operational bearings, and then there's some other bearings. And the operational bearings can be active or passive. So very interesting there. And we'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages of those systems. Here's an idea of what they look like. Look a lot like a battery energy storage system that you'd see for a chemical battery for lithium ion except it's got the flywheels in the underground. So what else is part of the system? You got the flywheel. We also have the energy converter. That's the, think of the motor generators. These are what we use to spin the flywheels up and what we use to get the energy back out when we uh, want to. And then some of the other things that I mentioned, catcher bearings, if the main bearings don't work, vacuums. We want to have this flywheel rotating as freely as possible. That's why we're levitating it on magnetic bearings and that we're uh, spinning it around in an atmosphere of very little resistance, a vacuum. And of course, cooling is very important. Anytime you're dealing with electricity, the efficiency goes right to heat. So we have to be able to reject that heat and deal with it effectively. There's some terms that'll come up if you ever get into this. And th this topic is for my energy risk engineers that are going to go out and do visits. You may hear of specific energy and energy density. Basically, one is just the energy store per unit mass and the other is the energy store per unit volume. All right, some of the main advantages, and I mentioned this before, the, the lifespan of a flywheel battery can be up to 20 years. So that's fantastic. They're very high efficiency. You get 85% of the energy back out that you put in. So we're going to start to see some of these things deployed more and more as we switch over more to renewables, if we do. The environmental friendliness, there are really no environmental impacts when you think about it's just a motor generator and it's some sort of composite or steel material that can be recycled very easily. They don't burn anything, so we're not creating effluent that we need to deal with. It, in the end, basically the only, only thing coming out of them are heat. So we might be putting a little heat into the environment. Another good look at it, see the MG sets on top and then the uh, flywheels are below ground to uh, be safer. Now, utilities can use these things for uh, frequency uh, regulation. They can uh, be used as interruptible power supplies. They can also be a buffer. So when uh, batteries start to uh, charge and discharge often, it, it stresses them much more than a flywheel energy storage system would be stressed. There's some mechanical stresses that go on charging and discharging we'll talk about later. Some other applications, transportation, uh, these are like regenerative brakes. Whenever you slow down, the power goes back into the flywheel. So it's probably very good for large applications like automotive or locomotive or marine. Another look at a more sophisticated unit. In this case, we've got a, a vacuum chamber and uh, we've got a rotating shaft. Now, as technology progresses, they're actually looking at making these things without shafts. Yeah, go figure, a flywheel without a shaft. It will be connected magnetically and it will run up magnetically. So there'll be a, a little lag in, in its acceleration and deceleration, but it'll also pick up some advantage of not having that weight of that shaft spinning in the middle, not really helping with the flywheel energy. So uh, that's an option. Flywheel energy systems for pulsed power applications. So what we do here is we basically have the flywheel running, and if we want to turn the satellite, we change the speed of the flywheel, and, and the conservation of angular momentum causes the satellite to turn.
Now, let's get into mechanical damage mechanisms so that we can figure out how they go wrong, what happens to them, and what we want to do as risk engineers to prevent that. Well, the rotor itself can structurally fail, right? The material is going under stress and it can experience fatigue. The centrifugal stresses try to pull it apart. There can be manufacturing defects that make it easier to come apart. And then the discs themselves, the rotors can delaminate if they're made of composites and just depending on how this material was put together, they can delaminate and come apart. Another way that the systems can fail is the bearings, the support systems that can be from heat, friction-induced heat. The bearings can wear, we can have lubrication issues that cause heat, misalignment and vibration effects can affect the bearings, and then thermal expansion issues. As these systems warm up, they start to expand and then the bearings might rub. So we have to be careful and uh, vigilant to protect against that. What other risks? Mechanical imbalance. Well, we can have this large flywheel start to get unbalanced. We can hit resonance speeds with it. We can amplify vibrations, and they're all potentially catastrophic failure modes. Now, there are some neat techniques where we can dynamically modify the balance, but again, that's a control system, and they're subject to failure. So you can see some of these smaller applications, a residential application might have the flywheel underground and start to not think of flywheels as big flat discs like, you know, uh, old record or the LP records that, that I might remember and you guys might not. But think of them more as a cylinder. And that's what's going to be a, a little bit more efficient at storing the energy is this cylindrical shape. What else can go wrong? Electrical system damage. So the inverter, just everything that we can go wrong at a solar facility or a power plant of any kind. When we're dealing with electricity, inverting, converting, insulation breakdown, switching, these are all failures that can happen in, the, in, in a generating system like this. Electrical control system risks. So the sensors can fail. The things that are keeping track of the vibrations, keeping track of the speed, the RPMs, control loop instabilities. It's all the same thing. Software, everything that can go wrong in a control system can still happen to flywheel energy storage systems. So we have to be ready to prevent against those. Energy transfer and charging. So just like in a regular battery, if you overcharge it or overcurrent, all these issues can uh, affect it. Now, charging, discharging stress, it's not as bad as it is on chemical batteries. However, it happens. So we have to manage it. We have to count the starts, the stops, the, the fast stops and starts. We have to be careful about, they call it thermal management failures, cooling systems, making sure that we're rejecting the heat to an appropriate location and that we don't fail to be able to do that. What about charging EVs? This is an interesting thing topic. Yeah, they're doing it in New York. And if you think about it, these flywheel energy storage systems are actually more suited to quick charging cars and EVs than lithium ion batteries are. Because lithium ion batteries take a long time to get their energy out and a long time to get their energy in. Not with flywheels. Flywheel energy storage systems, you spin them up fast and you get the juice out fast. So that'd be perfect for doing EVs. And you could protect if, if two or three cars come up in a row, then you're going to have to have sort of a battery system to recharge the flywheels. But it does look like this is a potential application if we keep using electrical vehicles. Now, how do we protect against the things that can go wrong? We have to be careful about the structural integrity. We're going to use advanced non-destructive testing. Uh, we're going to use mag particle, the same things we do in our big steam turbine rotors to look for cracks and, and stresses that are, could potentially expand into something worse. Like I said before, they have dynamic balancing systems, advanced bearing technologies, vibration dampening mechanisms, and then specialized containment design. Because if it all does fail and it does burst, we don't want the parts and components going elsewhere, going out where it could hurt anybody. Electrical system safeguards, same kind of things that we'd see in a, a typical generator, motor generator set. It's just what's making that motor generator move is a little bit different. It's a mechanical battery. Now, gets it, let's get into operational risk management for all my risk engineering buddies. Need maintenance, right? We have to have uh, inspections, testing, maintenance. We want to have predictive diagnostic techniques. Again, the vibration, we're going to look at it and 
figure out what's going wrong before it happens, real-time monitoring while it's operating so we can stop it. And we want to train the operators and we want to have good procedures. So it's all the same stuff we already know. Now we can apply it to flywheel energy storage systems as they come along. Gives you an idea. Some of this, this one's above ground and uh, it's out there uh, being marketed, kind of a cool idea. Now, the material selection is very important. We want to make sure that the uh, composites are tested and that they uh, are all proven. The manufacturers have a challenge in trying to develop their own test standards, their own test protocols, and then convincing the public and the market that their system is going to be safe in the insurance markets as well, right? Magnetic bearings. This is something that's going to be really cool because that will lift this whole rotor, this whole flywheel off of the bearing. And it can either be permanent magnets, which are called permanent, but they can lose their uh, magnetism over time, or electromagnets, which are going to rob some of the output of the system. So there's a trade off there and they have to have good controls. All right, just some more ideas of what these, they're out there, folks. This is not something that's uh, pie in the sky. So what I wanted to do is get all of my regular risk engineering buddies up to speed on what we can see for these flywheel energy storage systems. They aren't that complicated. They don't appear to be that risky. It doesn't look like there's the possibility for MFL type events or chain reactions from one location to the other. But again, that's going to depend on the uh, installation. So if you enjoyed it, give me a like and a subscribe, and I'll uh, talk to you on the next one. Thanks.